Yeah, hi Rohan. Uh, you hold an uh, assistant professor appointment at uh, CMU, which is, um, I would say, the most desirable uh, place to do computer science research in the world. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. And also congratulations to you for your uh, going position at NUS. Thank you. So you already started um, this position in 2020, right? Uh, I did. I started in uh, September of 2020. Uh, last year. So I've been an assistant professor almost one year now. And uh, what path uh, led you there? So can you perhaps uh, briefly introduce yourself a bit? Sure. Yeah. So um, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think I knew this is what I wanted to get into. So I grew up in um, India and I, uh, you know, was spent most of my life in Mumbai and India where I did my undergrad. And I didn't really know anybody who, you know, even had a PhD or, you know, was a research professor until I was somewhere in my 20s. Um, when I started, you know, I worked, did a master's degree uh, at a place and I was working on a master's thesis when I was the first time I actually got into a research project. Um, and I sort of you know, figured out what research is and I decided, I thought I liked it, spent a couple of years working at IBM Research in India. Uh, and I realized I wanted to do this sort of full time. And then I came over to UC Berkeley in uh, California uh, to do a PhD. And even at that point, I don't think I really knew that I wanted to be uh, an academic. I think all I wanted to do was just have the flexibility to do research and work on uh, topics that I like. And uh, I think it was maybe under my fourth year of my PhD or so when I uh, decided, well, maybe, you know, I can, maybe can do this forever. <laughs> and, you know, I like being in universities. Uh, I also ha had an opportunity to uh, teach a little bit when I was um, a graduate student at Berkeley. And I realized that I like both research and teaching. So I decided to apply for a faculty position. So uh, it was a very last minute decision and I graduated after my fifth year. So it was basically a one year before I applied that I decided I wanted to go down the spot. So this was definitely not something that I had uh, always wanted to do. I'm curious, so how did you get your PhD position? So for your contacts at IBM or who like, uh, uh, or how did you um, yeah, basically approach this or uh, got introduced to, to this? Yeah, I mean, I was doing research at IBM uh, in India. In fact, the the IBM Research Lab there had a good program. It was almost like a pre-doc position. So it's like a two-year uh, research position uh, for people who don't have PhDs, but want to get experience in uh, research. So I was basically like, you can imagine it to be like a, you know an extended research internship position where I was part of a research group uh, with other researchers who had PhDs. And I worked with them for two years. Um, I was in the team called uh, productivity tools and software engineering. So we were building uh, collaborative software engineering tools for uh, IBM um, software engineers and um, also got an opportunity to um, write some papers um, and attend some conferences. Uh, and I think that helped me a lot in actually deciding that I want to do this full time, um, apply for PhD programs and also the fact that I had research experience um, as well as recommendation letters at that point from uh, researchers at IBM uh, helped me, uh, I believe, get into um, grad school. And I was pretty happy to get into uh, uh, UC Berkeley. And uh, nowadays, what is your research on? Yeah, so I currently do research on uh, software testing. So I'm still in the area of software engineering that I uh, started doing, um, though currently I'm focusing on uh, automated software testing and finding bugs uh, in software, uh, not unlike uh, yourself and your own research uh, manual. So uh, my, I guess uh, the techniques that I've sort of focused on are mostly dynamic program analysis and uh, coverage guided fuzz testing. Um, in particular, my research is uh, sort of looks at the abstractions uh, that uh, software developers can use to communicate with automated testing tools. So my goal is to sort of enable uh, domain experts uh, to sort of write uh, automated testing um, sort of workflows uh, for their own application domains and find software bugs that are hard to find with just like off the shelf bug finding tools. How has your uh, journey been at uh, CMU so far? Uh, it's been pretty good. So it's, I mean, I've been here for, as I said, about almost one year now. Um, and uh, I am currently advising uh, two uh, PhD students uh, who are working in the, uh, well, I'm co-advising uh, two PhD students with uh, other faculty at CMU um, who are working in sort of the general area of, of software testing. Both of them are working on different application domains. One of them is looking at uh, bug finding for uh, software defined networks. Uh, my other student is looking at uh, software testing for uh, autonomous vehicles. They're completely different domains that I, uh, you know, have not looked at myself either, but this is an in interesting uh, new space uh, for me to get into. 
Um, and I also have uh, a bunch of uh, undergraduate students who are working with me and I have the privilege of uh, working with really amazing students at CMU um, and you know, mentoring them in their research projects. So right now, in fact, it's the summer here. So we have um, a lot of um, uh, undergraduate students from other universities who are visiting us. We have something called the REU program, which stands for Research Experience for Undergraduates. Uh, so these are students uh, typically from universities where they don't have a lot of, um, uh, say maybe research faculty or other uh, sort of resources uh, to engage in, um, in, in a lot of research. Uh, they sort of come to CMU to work with us and work on our research group. So uh, are we ever, and, and, and since uh, you know, things have opened up uh, at least in the United States because of the uh, success vaccinations, we actually have all of these interns uh, in Pittsburgh and, and it's, it's really great. So I've been working with about seven students uh, over the summer. Oh, wow. that sounds great. Yep. How did you find your first uh, graduate students? Yeah, so uh, CMU was really great in that uh, the moment I got um, my offer letter, or the moment I was moment I signed my offer letter. Sorry, when I decided that I'm actually, uh, you know, I will be coming to CMU and assign another dotted line. I think just the next day. So this was in about April of 2020. And I knew that I was going to join in the fall. So I was going to start in uh, August or September of 2020. Uh, so the moment I accepted my offer, the next very next day, they sent me um, the application packets of uh, students who uh, were admitted to the PhD program uh, just a couple of months before that. So the PhD admissions happens in January and February of every year. So there were about you know, 10 or 12 uh, students who were admitted to the program in this area of software engineering. Um, so the department sent me those applications and said, well, why don't you, you know, look at these uh, students uh, see if any of um, you know, their profiles interest you and feel free to reach out and talk to them. So I spent the summer actually contacting uh, these students, um, had Zoom calls with many of them. And we sort of, you know, there were a couple of students with whom um, you know, we, I, I found that our sort of research interests uh, overlap. So even though I did not know them during the admissions process, even though they did not know me when they accepted their you know, PhD offer at CMU, they did know that I was coming there. And then therefore we sort of uh, ended up uh, working together uh, when the fall semester started. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Um, and I guess a little bit of context uh, to, to this, because it might work a little bit differently at other schools, is that at least in CMU, uh, in our department in ISR, um, PhD students are admitted to the department or the program, not uh, necessarily to an advisor. So they knew they were coming to CMU, but they didn't necessarily uh, have, I mean, they were not committed to one specific professor. So it was possible for them to sort of, uh, you know, decide after they came in, uh, you know, which advisor they want to work with. And it was also possible for me to be able to, um, become the advisor officially. And uh, since you just mentioned uh, ISR, so can you tell us a bit how ISR fits into the computer science landscape at uh, CMU? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So uh, ISR stands for the Institute uh, for Software Research. So it's a department at CMU um, within the broader School of Computer Science. So CMU is, uh, is kind of sort of a outlier in that sense that it's uh, you know one of the uh, few, I guess, universities, at least in the United States, um, that uh, where your know, computer science, you know, it's, it's so big that it's not just at the department level; it's, a, it's an entire school. So in other places, computer science is often in the you know something that's like a school or college of engineering or of mathematics or of science. Uh, here, computer science is itself um, a school uh, because of the large number of faculty and students that are uh, involved in computer science at CMU. So within the school of computer science, we have about I think seven departments. So we have dedicated departments for uh, machine learning. We have a robotics department. We have a computational biology department. You know, HCI Institute, and the another um, uh, department is the Institute of Software Research, which is what I'm part of. And at ISR, um, we have two uh, dedicated sort of graduate uh, PhD programs. Um, so one is the PhD program in software engineering, and the other one is a PhD program in societal computing. Uh, and I primarily work with the software engineering PhD program, as well as also the undergraduate and master's uh, components of, of software engineering um, within the School of Computer Science. Um, so, so that's really cool because uh, I get to you know, work with students and faculty uh, who are all sort of working in the general area of software engineering. Um, so they're you know, involved in different aspects of software engineering, but it's really great because uh, there is really a very large number of uh, faculty uh, and, and students working here in this area, uh, which makes for great uh, you know, collaboration and networking opportunities. And um, what kind of support uh, did you receive so far? For example, from senior faculty or uh, from CMU itself? Uh, yeah, um, so uh, do you mean in, in support in, in the form of sort of mentorship or any other sort of formal support? Uh, yeah, just to basically get uh, things bootstrapped and started and perhaps some feedback on what you're doing and so on. Yeah, so definitely there's a, 
uh, there's a lot of support here from from both the junior and senior faculty. So I think uh, at least uh, at CMU, there's a very um, uh, there's this culture where uh, the senior faculty often try to do things that will sort of help junior faculty bootstrap their uh, the research program. So whether it's about like choice of teaching classes or whether it's in things like collaboration or maybe writing grants together, there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm for helping junior faculty sort of uh, you know get started with the research programs, even things like students. So when I was looking for students to advise, if there was you know quote unquote competition between let's say you know another faculty member and me, they would say, well you know this is a junior faculty member, let them be the advisor, let them have the first preference in being able to work with the student. I don't want to compete with them. So uh, in that sense, it was a very welcoming uh, department. I didn't feel that I was you know intimidated by any of the other uh, faculty members here. Uh, there are a lot of junior faculty in software engineering, so it's it's fun. We you know we hang out uh, now that we've started working in person. You know, everyone's uh, you know works uh, just a few doors down. We are all sort of on one floor. You know, we grab lunch together, so it's a very uh, collegial uh, department, and we socialize quite a bit. Uh, and then we also have um, uh, you know all faculty sort of you know meetings and 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 given the size of uh, uh, ISR, because as I mentioned before, ISR is a uh, sort of smaller department within the School of Computer Science, uh, the, the community is also sort of more concentrated. So if I choose to only, uh, you know, let's say, uh, you know, uh, interact with the ISR faculty, it's a much smaller group. So we all sort of know each other really well. Uh, and it, it makes for uh, a much nicer sort of tighter community, uh, you know, than if you were sort of looking at like 200 faculty members. How much research uh, did you get uh, done in your first uh, year? Oh, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a tricky question to answer. Uh, so yeah, so in my first year, at least in my first uh, semester, uh, I had a teaching release. So I was not uh, required to teach in my first semester. Um, so I could spend my entire first semester working on sort of research and um, also you know, bootstrapping my research group. So uh, I guess I spent a lot of time at that point, um, you know, working since it was new students and since I was new as well, um, in trying to sort of start uh, new projects uh, and at least in entered domains that I have uh, pre not previously been uh, working on and also start collaborations with, uh, you know, new partners uh, who I've never worked with before. So I think the first semester was, uh, was very great uh, in that respect. Uh, this was the fall of 2020. In the spring of 2021, I was teaching a full class for the first time. I was co-teaching a class on program analysis. Um, so, so that was also interesting, and now we're again in the in the in the summer, so we're doing a lot of research. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I, we have uh, some you know uh, undergraduate students who are visiting us for the summer. Uh, so there's a lot more research activity going on um, right now as well. And I did spend you know uh, some time in my first year also writing a lot of uh, grant proposals, which is very new to me uh, as a junior faculty member. So that was also uh, exciting, but also a learning experience. And for what kind of grant proposals uh, did you apply, or for what? What grant proposals would one typically apply for? Yeah, so there are you know variety of sources of uh, funding for junior faculty. Uh, so I applied for anything that I you know could see would be relevant uh, at least to my research area. So I applied for a um, so in the U.S. we have this thing called National Science Foundation, so uh, which are sent for NSF. Um, so a lot of faculty, uh, junior faculty, applied for NSF grants in their first year. It's also I guess the you know largest source of funding. Uh, for CS researchers in, in the United States. So it's a natural place to apply for um, NSF grants. Uh, and that's the thing, the one that you know, takes the most amount of time because it's a fairly large comprehensive uh, you know, grant uh, proposal that one has to write. It's, you know, it's, it's like 15 pages and has, has a lot of um, uh, requirements on how that should be. And it also has a long process in you know, getting reviews and feedback. So you want, you know, want to get it right. Uh, one good thing was that because of uh, the pandemic, they relaxed the deadline. So usually I think the deadline for proposals is October 31st of every year, but this year they made a drooling deadline. So I didn't have to submit by October 31st. I could submit it later. So I submitted it, I don't know, somewhere in December or January. Uh, so that was uh, nice uh, that, uh, you know, uh, I had that flexibility to do that. Uh, then I also applied for some industry grants. Uh, so there are many, uh, you know, companies like, you know, Amazon, Facebook, uh, and others that uh, have these calls. Uh, those are much easier to apply for. Uh, they're just, you know, one usually one or two page proposals. Um, you also get back the the results really quickly, but uh, you know that they, they are they're also very highly competitive. And then I also applied for grants at uh, you know other sort of centers uh, of of funding. So I am affiliated with uh, Scilab, which is a cybersecurity research center within CMU. 
which is sort of a, you know, it's not a depart academic department as such, but it's a center where, uh, for sort of interdisciplinary research uh, that you know, cuts across departments like electrical engineering, computer science, and others. Uh, bringing together faculty and students who work in the general area of cybersecurity. So they have a lot of industry partners. So I applied for a seed grant uh, with them and I, you know, I received that uh, seed grant fairly quickly because uh, you know, they have a really quick uh, turnaround process. Uh, so that really helped me get started as well uh, with my uh, research group. I see. And I mean, since you're doing um, research that is also very relevant for industry, I assume that also you can expect to already got some gift funding from companies or? Right. So I, uh, as I mentioned, so like the, the, the Scilab uh, uh, I, grant that I got is sort of the seed, seed money. Um, it goes through the center. So they have a lot of industry partners. So it's sort of done at the center level. So I'm not directly working with an industrial partner, but uh, it comes in through Scilab. Uh, so that was really nice to have. And I'm also talking to other uh, industry people. So one thing that you have to do as a junior faculty member is, uh, you know, talk, talk to a lot of, uh, you know, people. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can give talks at uh, various different places. So I did spend a lot of time giving talks at various companies as well in my first year. Uh, and, and those are the things that help uh, build up some of these relationships. Uh, I did not get some of the uh, industry award that I'd applied to. I think the Google research award, uh, I, you know, I got a, uh, got a rejection email from them a few months ago. So that was kind of a bummer, but I also heard that that happened to many other people who are much senior than me. So I don't feel bad about it. <laughs> Yeah, how would you compare the environment at uh, CMU with the one at uh, Berkeley where you did your PhD? Right, so I think uh, one of the major differences is just in the size of uh, the communities. So both Berkeley and CMU are you know, great schools with a lot of uh, amazing you know, CS researchers uh, working in uh, you know, both like programming languages, software engineering, as well as other fields uh, that are adjacent to my research area. Um, but the key difference, I think, is that uh, like at Berkeley, um, you know, electrical engineering and computer science is one large uh, department. So that's a uh, you know, large number of faculty members and students, I think maybe over 150 uh, faculty members, I think somewhere around four or 500 PhD students. Um, so even though there are a lot of these people uh, there, uh, it, is, it's just, it's, it is a large place. You need to be able to like find the right people, you know, within your uh, department, uh, you know, who might be uh, you know, folks who you might want to connect with or, you know, who, who, with whom you might um, want to, let's say, foster collaborations. Uh, at CMU, we have exactly that, you know, that size um, overall in the School of Computer Science. So you always, you know, for example, I don't work at all in, you know, machine learning or HCI, but I always know that I can go to the machine learning department or the HCI Institute and find experts in that field if I have to. Uh, but at the same time, because we have these uh, smaller departments, like I currently work in uh, ISR, uh, which is the Institute for Software Research, um, it's, it's much nicer because I actually work with software engineering researchers all the time, uh, which means that, um, you know, we have a dedicated sort of software engineering PhD program with, uh, I think we have that's around 40 or so PhD students who are working in the area of software engineering. And then we have our sort of departmental and program level events. So we have things like weekly seminar series and uh, semesterly, you know, other events where we sort of get together. So I, in my first six months as a faculty member in ZMU, I think I could tell you the you know, general research area or thesis topic of every single PhD student in our program. There was no way, like I was in Berkeley for five years, I couldn't, you know, I, I, I can't do that. There's just way too many more people. So I think the, the fact that we have the small department and the small program uh, makes it much easier to get to know everybody else and get, you know, start these collaborations. And I think that uh, small, you know, small community feeling is, uh, is something that's, uh, you know, that I've realized that I like quite a bit over here. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah. So I guess we chatted now quite a bit about your experience at uh, CMU so far. So perhaps let's uh, start chatting about uh, the interview experience that you had. Right, and, sure. And perhaps you can give a general kind of overview of your, uh, of the timeline and also the process. Sure, yeah. So, uh, I mean, the general process is that uh, if you're applying, so I was applying for faculty positions starting uh, in the fall of 2020, 2020. Uh, so I had to start applying in um, November uh, 2019 or so. Uh, so the first thing, of course, in the process is, you know, send any applications. Uh, you know, universities have deadlines for sending an I mean, application packet, which involves a research statement, teaching statement. Uh, many universities also ask for a third document, it's variously called a diversity statement or a DEI statement or broader impact statement. Um, as well as uh, your letters of recommendation and other sort of supporting documents at that time. 
And then you hear back uh, from universities who want to call you to interview you sometime in uh, January or February. And then interviews are scheduled, you know, the, the following year from around February to April or so. So that was, you know, the standard process. Um, I sent in my application mostly in November. I sent some of them in December as well. Uh, and then I heard back in, uh, in January. So I was on the job market in the crazy pandemic year. So uh, I got my first interview invitations in January. I went for some interviews in February and I think even early March. Uh, but that's when the pandemic, uh, you know, became really bad in the United States. And then travel was shut down. Um, and then in most places, we could not, uh, you know, go visit the, the campus for our in-person interviews. So most of my interviews from the middle of March to uh, late April 2020 actually happened virtually over Zoom, uh, including the, my interview at CMU. So my interview at CMU was completely on Zoom. Uh, and uh, that, was, that was a fairly, I guess, weird experience <laughs> or interesting experience at least, uh, so to speak. I guess it was also then exactly the time where everyone had to improvise a lot, right? Absolutely, yeah, because none of us had done this before. Uh, so we were all sort of winging it in terms of uh, I mean, both the interviewers and the interviewees, right? So even the fact that you were interviewing us had never interviewed someone before, they'd never ever made an offer to someone who they had never met. So I think it was also, you know, I was worried like, oh, you know, will this jeopardize my chances of getting um, a good job? Because, well, will, will they actually give me an offer if they never met me? Uh, but it turned out that that was fine. Um, so the first couple of virtual interviews were uh, difficult, um, but I think eventually everyone got used to it. Uh, but yes, we did have to improvise a lot. Um, uh, fortunately, I was also in contact with many other, um, uh, I guess, you know, uh, faculty candidates who are also in the job market. Uh, and therefore, we were sort of able to synchronize a little bit on sharing our experiences uh, about virtual interviews and share tips on, um, you know, how to get through this uh, together. So that was, uh, that was helpful. I also remember you had a, a Twitter um, thread on tips, right? So what would you re recommend for this kind of uh, remote interviews? Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so you can. We could probably share a link to that uh, Twitter thread uh, somewhere in the description. So I, um, yeah, I do, I do think that you know doing interviews remotely you know has its uh, challenges because you don't actually get to you know meet with people and sort of talk to them and strike up a sort of personal uh, uh, you know rapport with someone. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know there were other sort of you know benefits. So like I didn't have to travel as much, for example. So traveling to places for physical interviews is extremely tiring. And uh, in the first couple of months when I was traveling, it was like, you know, you go um, to another city, sometimes another country. Uh, one of my interviews was in, it was in Europe. So I had to go, all, you know, um, uh, fly for many hours and just come back in two days and then go for another interview, with the, you know, the next week. So that was really tiring. So, you know, doing virtual interviews is much less physically demanding. Uh, so that was, um, that was nice. And also, uh, since I was on my desk, I could have, you know, if I've done some prep work and I had some notes about um, you know, uh, the people who are interviewing me, I could have those right on my desk. So I could, you know, refresh my memory and, you know, remember who I'm actually talking to, uh, which is much harder to do when you're sort of in person and you don't, uh, you know, you can't uh, match names to faces and you're, you know, some suddenly like, who is this person? Uh, so I think that was, uh, that was helpful. Uh, at the same time, yeah, uh, I think things like giving uh, talks virtually is very hard because you don't see the, uh, the faces of your audience members. So it's really hard to get feedback uh, if you're giving a job talk in terms of, you know, are, are you making sense? Are they able to, you know, follow along? Uh, I had a couple of jokes in my job talk that went really terribly on Zoom because I had no idea if anybody was laughing or not. So it was a really, uh, you know, serious reaction to, you know, anything that I, you know, said that I'd, when I was trying to be funny. So that was a little awkward. Uh, <laughs> and then I had to improvise and like edit my talk to get rid of all of those, you know, those, those jokes because I weren't working on Zoom. So... Um, yeah, that required a little bit of work. Um, and I have a bunch of other tips in that Twitter thread, so uh, you can check that out as well. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, and that's very relatable also. <laughs> yeah, and ho hopefully, you know, those who are listening to this will not have to go through virtual interviews. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we will be back to in-person interviews uh, from the next cycle onwards. So in terms of uh, preparation, so where did you look for this kind of open positions? Uh, open positions, one of the best resources for open positions is the CRA uh, website. So they have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, bulletins on um, uh, faculty position openings. But otherwise, I, you know, I had some universities in mind where I wanted to apply. And frankly, you just go to their department websites in November. Uh, almost every university has a 
a page that says, you know, faculty hiring and we're hiring for this position, tenure track position. So it's it's fairly easy to find openings if you know which universities you're already looking at. If you want to discover universities, then things like CRA um, is useful because you've learned about opportunities that you probably had not considered because you hadn't looked at that university before. Um, and in some cases, I mean, I knew there was a university that I wanted to apply to, but they didn't have anything on their website. And in that case, I, you know, if I knew someone there, I would just email uh, a professor there and say, hey, you know, I, I'm on the job market. Are you planning on hiring this year? Will there be a uh, position that's open? And um, in a couple of places, like, you know, I got responses. One person said, yes, we will have a link open, you know, next week. Hold on. Another another place, they said, no, we're not hiring this year. Sorry about that. So you can just you can find out from people uh, at that university as well. How did you then um, proceed uh, with writing the like uh, statements and in general preparing the application package? Right. Uh, so yeah, so it, it takes some time to sort of you know sit and write down these research statements. I, I will say it takes the most amount of time it takes just to write the first sentence. So I think I you know spent about one or two months with an empty page, <laughs> staring at it and thinking what I was going to write. But once I started writing, uh, it went fairly quickly. Uh, maybe a couple, few couple more weeks. So I started pre preparing in like the August of 2019. So it was like August to uh, I guess October or or so when I had my first draft ready. So maybe two months or so, two and a half to three months was the overall preparation time for all my uh, statements, uh, like research statement, uh, teaching statement, and um, in diversity or broader impact statement. Um, I also I started asking my references if you know they would uh, provide me with uh, recommendation letters uh, sometime in August or so. And I think that was maybe a little bit too late. Uh, I would say that. Um, yeah, the, that preparation should ideally be done much earlier uh, because if you're trying to find people who would write, uh, write you letters, uh, it's, it's better to sort of identify them early on. Uh, and especially if you don't have, like I, in my case, I, I think I was panicking a little bit because I didn't have enough letter writers because I had mostly worked with only my um, advisor at Berkeley. I had not worked with multiple faculty members at that point. So you know, getting you know, four or five letters was uh, a little bit tricky for me. Uh, so I, at that time, was panicking and I was you know, wondering how I, I would even do this. Uh, so I would, you know, if I, if I were to do it again, I would say you start early and then maybe, you know, find ways to uh, start collaborations with people who might be a good uh, references uh, on your application. And uh, later on, how did you manage your letter writers? Um, did you have some kind of online sheet or how did you remind them about uh, submitting the, uh, the recommendation letters? Right. Yeah. So I eventually, once I identified, uh, you know, people who uh, would write me strong letters and when I said identified, I mean, I identified them, reached out to them, asked them and they said, yes, um, I had a bunch of names and then I told them how many applications to expect. So when I started applying, uh, they had a sort of rough idea of how many applications they will get. And then I also had a spreadsheet, uh, like a Google spreadsheet that I created one for each of my letter writers. Uh, where I had a list of you know universities that I applied to, and then I had a sort of status column that says, "Have you received an uh, email from that university asking for your letter? Yes or no? And have you uploaded your letter to that university?" Uh, so that was really helpful uh, because not all universities send emails. In fact, there are some universities I applied to where they were like, "You know, you should just ask your letter writers to email us at this address." So you have to sort of make sure that they do that. Uh, in some places, they just you know send out a link saying upload a PDF here. Some other universities have even more crazy rules, um, so it's it's good to have that sheet to keep track of uh, you know who has received what links and uh, whether they've submitted the letters or not. Uh, you know, most of them do, and you know people who you ask to write letters probably have done this before. So you know it's they know sort of what to expect, but uh, you have to push them. Like at least one of my letter writers. Uh, didn't send even a single letter till like you know December thirty first or something like that. So I was panicking again a little bit, but eventually they did and it was fine. And I think the universities also know that. Uh, so they also, if they see someone's name on you know on there and they don't see a letter, it's not like they're immediately going to reject you. Uh, they will probably you know wait until those letters come in, or they would reach out to that person saying, hey, you know, we expect a letter from you uh, for say Rohan's application. So. Uh, could you send it in right now? And uh, talking about deadlines, so um, when did you submit your application materials? Did you also try to submit them as soon as possible? Or did you, for example, even submit some after the deadline? Or what was your approach there? Yeah, so the deadlines are, in many cases, the deadlines are sort of soft. 
uh, although they don't say that. I mean, it appears that most of the deadlines are hard. Uh, but typically, if, if the deadlines are in like November or December, um, I don't actually think, uh, you know, the recruiting committees are discussing things over, uh, you know, the winter break uh, until, you know, at least after the new year. Um, so there was at least one place uh, that I remember, or actually two places, where I submitted my application after the deadline in January, and it was completely fine. So in most places, I submitted, you know, on time in November. And I, I, again, the deadline that's on the website is for the applicant and not for the letter writers. So although my applications all went in my November or so, most of my letters came in after the deadline. So the deadline is mostly for the application so that they know who's applied uh, and so that they can sort of, you know, divide the um, applications the way they want uh, among within the recruiting committee um, for, uh, you know, <laughs> however they want to do it. Um, but the letters can come later. Um, in my case, there were a couple of universities that I had not originally applied to, but then, you know, in January or so, when my advisor was sending letters, he's like, hey, I went down your list and I didn't see this place. Why don't you apply here as well? And then there's another university where I got a you know, Twitter message from someone saying, hey, you know, you, we really want you to apply here. Or, you know, would you consider us? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? So I sent in my application like a week after the deadline. And, and that was totally fine. What kind of resources did you utilize for uh, writing this uh, different kind of statements? Uh, yeah, so I looked at a lot of examples. So there's actually a fantastic um, uh, guide or sort of an, uh, an article uh, online that's authored by Wes Weimer, Claire Leguez, uh, Zach Fry, and some others. Uh, I think it's called the CS Faculty Job Guide. You can you know, share the link uh, again in the in the description. Uh, I should just call it the Faculty Job Search Bible because I was <laughs> bookmarked on my uh, web browser and I would you know visit it several times a day for like two months straight. Uh, it has a lot of resources on the entire pro application process, uh, on you know how to prepare some of these uh, statements. There are a lot of examples of uh, statements uploaded by um, you know senior faculty members or you know, people who are now senior faculty, but these are, these are statements that they wrote when they applied maybe five or ten years ago. Uh, so it was very insightful reading some of those um, documents and sort of learning from them, uh, you know, learning from examples, so to speak. And that's that's mostly what I did. I used those as uh, as resources. Um, and then I also was able to get some feedback from uh, faculty members at Berkeley uh, who you know were uh, gracious enough to sort of go over my um, statements and then you know give me fine grained feedback on how I can improve things. Um, about the cover letter, so. Uh, did you write um, generic ones or mostly generic generic ones that you slightly adapted, for example, by changing the institution, or did you tailor the letters to the individual institutions uh, completely? Right. Yeah. So cover letters, I wrote mostly generic ones. So again, that job faculty guide actually has some examples of cover letters. I just took one of those examples and modified it a little bit because the cover letters don't doesn't uh, really have a lot of you know special information. They're mostly generic. Uh, they usually just, you know, say who you are, where you are currently at, what your what position you're applying to, and then maybe a brief blurb about, uh, you know, yourself or your your uh, research area. And I guess the main purpose of the cover letter is to make sure that your file goes to the right place. Uh, so I, in most cases, it was generic. Uh, if somebody had asked me to apply to a place specifically, I would say, you know, I've spoken to professor so and so, and they've asked me to apply. So that you know my application is not lost. At least that professor will be contacted, saying that hey, Rowan has applied. What do we do with this application? Uh, in some other places, so for example, at CMU, uh, all the applications for all the different CS uh, departments uh, sort of went into the same portal. So I had to you know be very specific and say I'm applying for the tenure track position in software engineering at ISR, so that it comes to the right place. Uh, so you just want to make sure that you are you know able to uh, route it correctly to the right person. Uh, so to speak. Um, and, and I guess that's that's mostly what I focus on doing. Makes sense. And in terms of diversity statements, because uh, they are still rather new, um, yep. can you describe like what they are about and how did you approach uh, writing yours? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, this the statement is called different things at, at different places. Some places call it the diversity statement. Some places call it diversity, equity, inclusion, DEI statement. Uh, at CMU, it's called the broader impact statement. So it doesn't necessarily use the word diversity. It could be anything. Generally, these statements, um, what they're looking for is they're looking for um, the applicants' sort of, um, you know, membership in the broader academic community and how they could, you know, contribute positively to being, uh, you know, a professional member of the community and improving the climate of, uh, you know, our uh, field of, of of research or academia in general. Um, so. Uh, 
this is distinct from the research and teaching statements, of course, because the research statement, you know, talks about a research, the teaching statement talks about your sort of teaching and education qualities. Uh, th this is sort of the, you know, the catch-all statement that talks about anything else sort of the, that, that, you know, that, uh, that you may have done um, as a member of the community. Um, so the, you know, the contents of the statement will vary quite a bit from applicant to applicant. And from what I know, uh, you know, they are very highly specialized to one's own experience. So some people talk about their own experiences with maybe certain issues that they've either faced or overcome in their, um, you know, uh, time as let's say a graduate student or as a you know researcher and what they have done maybe to help other people in the sort of the, the same, uh, who are facing sort of similar issues, or maybe they might talk about, uh, you know, their contributions to things like, uh, you know, being involved in uh, societies or organizations or things like conference or journal organization, being on committees and trying to, let's say, improve the state of uh, anything from, let's say, you know, reviewing to, uh, you know, broadening participation in computing amongst, uh, you know, uh, underrepresented communities um, or even sort of globally. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the contents vary a lot. And, and therefore, there's, you know, there's no one, uh, I guess advice or one you know, specification that can be given to anybody in this case. Um, the, the CS faculty job guide that I mentioned um, earlier does have examples of some of these statements. So those were also helpful uh, to, you know, to, to, at least for me uh, to, 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 to get an idea of what they would look like. They're typically expected to be shorter than your research statement. So uh, I think about a one or two page uh, statement should be good enough. What were your considerations when applying for institutions? So how did you decide whether you want to apply or not? Um, in choosing institutions, I guess I mostly looked at uh, a combination of just like top schools. Uh, and when I say top schools, I don't mean like a particular, you know, ranking website or anything. I just mean like, you know, schools which uh, were, you know, are, I knew to be, you know, active in the research area um, that I want to work in. So, you know, places where I've, you know, read papers, um, places where there are faculty who work there and I've read their papers. Uh, or maybe just universities where, you know, there are, let's say, people who I knew who I would maybe like to have as colleagues and work with them, uh, or just universities in locations that I would like to live in. So I think I focused on, you know, locations, um, the, the people there, and uh, generally the research activity in my area. When preparing your job talk, like what kind of structure did you follow? Uh, in the job talk? Um, so I guess the structure so was sort of... Um, let me see. The structure of my job talk was very similar to, I guess, the structure of my, you know, dissertation talk or, you know, thesis defense. Uh, and I think this is true for many people that I've spoken to, uh, that, uh, you know, graduate students create for the first time, um, you know, a presentation that sort of links many of the different sort of research projects or that they've worked on or papers that they've written. Uh, usually when they write their sort of thesis proposal or, you know, do their calls or prelims exam. It's called different things at different universities. And I had the same thing. So at Berkeley, we had this something called the calls um, exam or qualifying examination, where I had to sort of propose my, my thesis topic. And it was the first time where I synthesized, uh, you know, ideas from different projects that I was working on into sort of a bigger picture. And I think all of my talks since then, including my dissertation talk, my job talk, and like, well, maybe at least 10 or 15 talks I've given in the last one year have been, you know, some mutation of that original slide deck that I created then. Uh, so the job talk was sort of mostly structured as, uh, you know, a story of, I guess, you know, my research um, area overall, what are the sort of main overall problems that I'm trying to solve, uh, why it's sort of hard to do that with, uh, you know, you know, existing or you know, prior work, and uh, maybe some, you know, brief technical details about two or three projects that I've worked on, as well as some projects, minor details about projects that I've uh, collaborated with as a sort of a minor contributor uh, uh, elsewhere. And then it had a significant component of uh, sort of future work and things that I would um, want to do, uh, you know, once I started as faculty. In fact, my job talk is, is actually would be online on YouTube somewhere since I give all, almost all my talks, uh, you know, on, on Zoom, they were recorded. Uh, so I can also share a um, link to uh, either my job talk or my dissertation talk, which basically was the same thing. Uh, so I can share, share a link to that as well. Yeah, I guess people can also look at your CV and see for what institutions you applied based on this, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I'm not necessarily trying to hide what uh, institution that I was applying to. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so we've talked now quite a bit about preparing for the interviews. Uh, let's continue with uh, interviewing itself or almost uh, continue. So how did the okay. invitation email typically look like? Uh, 
like the first kind of email that you received from the institution uh, you applied for? Right. So typically, uh, once you apply, there's just uh, you know radio silence. So I applied in most of my place, most of the places I applied to. I sent my document uh, documents in November, December, or the latest one is early January. Uh, and then you don't hear anything for a while until typically the end of January or early February. Uh, but then you just get an email from one person who, you know, usually there's a host in every university who is often someone in uh, your research area. So most of the time, the host in the university uh, from whom I got emails was a researcher in, you know, either software engineering or programming languages uh, or systems uh, who sent an email to me saying that, you know, they, they want to talk. Uh, so there are actually two different modes in which most universities do interviews some of them directly invite you to their uh, campus for the main you know long interview some of them do the sort of pre-screening where they invite you for a uh, you know, short zoom call or a skype call uh, to have a conversation with just two or three faculty members for about 30 minutes or sometimes 60 minutes uh, and then only after that if you sort of you know, meet some criteria they will really call you for the uh, actual uh, you know on-campus long interview uh, so typically, this was an email that I got from the, you know my host saying that you know we want to uh, we looked at the application uh, and then you know we find it interesting and we want to interview you and then if it's an in-person um, uh, interview invitation, they typically give um, several candidate dates uh, for scheduling that interview. Uh, so uh, you know there's there's a back and forth discussion to sort of figure out which dates you can go and visit in person if your interview is in person. For me, some of those interviews also were in Zoom. Uh, and if it's in person, then they also sort of help you with things like, you know, booking your uh, your travel, or they might connect you to somebody in their university who might help you to book things like travel, like flights and hotels uh, for that particular date. Um, I will say that many of these invitations appear in a in sort of this, you know, in a burst. So, you know, for a long time, you would not hear anything. And then suddenly there would be like, you know, four emails, and they all want to interview you in the same week. So there is sort of this back and forth uh, in are trying to uh, schedule these interviews so that they don't conflict with each other, uh, but eventually it all works out. Can you expand how you uh, decided to schedule them? I assume that the CMU interview was not the first one and also not the one of the last ones, right? So yeah, or, exactly, yeah. Right, so that's a good point. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, advice has been passed down for I guess, generations that, that uh, typically, you know, you want your the, the top candidates of schools that you're applying to you would ideally want to schedule them in the middle of your uh, interview cycle uh, with the you know, hypothesis being that your first interview well, you've never interviewed before. So it's probably not going to, you know, it may not go as well. And then if you interview at many places by the end of the cycle and like by May or so, you're going to be so tired that, uh, you know, you wouldn't <laughs> be excited enough uh, to, you know, participate in interviews either. Uh, and that was actually, I think, fairly accurate for me. Um, I think my first interview was not as bad as expected. I think I just needed one interview maybe to get get prepared. Um, but certainly towards the end, the quality of my interviews, you know, was was going down. I was like super tired uh, by around April or so, and I was not really uh, you know focusing as much because each interview, when you're doing this on campus or you know two day long interviews, you're talking to like maybe around twenty different professors. And uh, you know you're you're having conversation with them, you're reading up about them, you're sort of finding out what their research is, trying to find collaboration opportunities, giving a job talk, and you're doing this giving the same job talk in many places, and you're meeting so many new people and you know reading about so many you know new uh, I guess researchers and, and their background that it can get really exhausting. So by the end of it, you know I've probably uh, you know looked at more than uh, you know two three hundred. Uh, personal web pages, maybe read many of their papers. Uh, so it was it was tiring. So you know you you want to try to schedule uh, interviews for universities that you really really want. I'd done the middle, or if not, I, my recommendation is towards the beginning because the beginning still went uh, fairly well for me. So my CMU interview actually was in March, which was like right in the middle of the cycle. So that was good. Uh, my first interview was in like February, I think, early February, and my last one was um, the end of April. So. If I was fortunate enough to be able to, you know, have my CMU interview right in March, and CMU was one of my top choices, so it, it worked out really well. Did you have any kind of uh, strategy? Because you mentioned that uh, that process is like very tiring, especially towards the end. So, did you have any strategy to maintain like your mental and physical health? Yeah. Um, so I, 
Yeah, it is. It is definitely very hard uh, to, to do that. I mean, you know, everybody has different uh, techniques that they would use to sort of relax and unwind. Um, uh, for me, at least when I was doing sort of these, you know, Zoom interviews, uh, virtual interviews, I think one of the most important things was to eat, uh, you know, eat eat well and you know stay hydrated. Uh, so I would make sure to sort of you know order food in uh, that would you know, that would be ready for me that I could just like, you know, reheat and, and eat in the middle of these interviews, uh, had a lot of fluids out of juices, um, you know, exercise, so like, you know, you know, wake up early in the morning. A lot of these interviews also start very early. Uh, if it's in person, often the first meeting is like a breakfast meeting at eight o'clock and it goes on until like, you know, dinner at like nine o'clock. Um, if it's a virtual uh, interview for me, I had some interviews on in different time zones. So I had to wake up and give a job talk at like 5.30 in the morning. So it was... Uh, you know, it's difficult to sort of uh, plan some of those things. So I would say, yeah, just uh, you know, eat, eating well, exercising, and making sure to get good sleep was uh, at least you know what what I would do. Um, and um, yeah, if you have uh, it, another good thing is if you have people to talk to. So I also had I was in contact with uh, other faculty candidates as well as you know friends who were you know, just in in Berkeley uh, as well as family members. And I think it was just good to be able to unwind uh, and then talk to them after many of these interviews. And uh, what was the structure um, of your visit at uh, CMU like? Uh, the structure of my visit at CMU. So I didn't actually visit CMU in person. So my interview is completely uh, virtual. So the it was a two-day interview. Um, and most of it was one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, various you know, current professors. Um, there was a job talk that was scheduled, I believe, in the morning, um, early morning on the first day. Uh, so that's another thing. Yeah, it's really good to have your job talk scheduled on the, you know, early in the process, because if not, then if let's say if your job talk is on the second day or if it's in the afternoon of the first day, then all of the one-on-one -on -one meetings that you have with professors before your job talk are going to start with them asking you, can you tell me about your research in, you know, because they haven't heard your job talk. So it's basically going to be a, you know, repetition of your job talk in a one-on-one -on -one meeting you know 10 times back to back so that gets annoying so uh, if if it's possible try to talk to your host and say can i give my job talk first thing in the morning on day one and that's that's really helpful if they have the ability to schedule it that way um after that as i said i had like one-on-one -on -one meetings with many different faculty members i had one-on-one -on -one meetings with the um with the dean at many places and it's at cmu as well i think and also there was a meeting with the students and it's very important to have uh, that meeting with uh, you know a bunch of grad students um uh, you know, whom, you know, who would be a part of the department that you may join if you accept, uh, if you get an offer from there. Getting an invitation from CMU, did this also mean that you got an invitation from all of the other places you applied for? Uh, not, not at all. I don't think that there, <laughs> there is any such uh, uh, necessary correlation. So I don't think that, okay, for sure, you know, the, my, my interviews do not correlate, the interview um, uh, invitations that I got do not correlate either with university rank or with my own personal preferences it was it was very uh, random and i've heard from many people that it's uh, you know the, the process is uh, very unpredictable i mean i've now also been on the other side for one year because we just did our faculty hiring this year at cmu so i can i can yeah i can definitely tell you that the there are so many factors that are involved in deciding who to interview it's not just based on you know who's the best researcher out there it's often on things like you know what um, You know, what particular research area uh, you know that university is looking to hire in what particular courses they are trying to find someone to teach um what other you know hiring goals they may have are they interviewing too many people from the same area there's there's, uh, there's a lot of factors that go in and uh, therefore if you know we don't get an uh, interview invitation from somewhere i think you should not one should not take it personally and i think that was uh, one really good advice a piece of advice that i got from uh, i think jean yang uh, who said that you know, i should not <laughs> you know, think of it as a, uh, uh, all, all, it's, all, it's almost like, you know, you're, it, you're marketing sort of a product, right? So it's like, it, it's really hard to predict if you're, you know, you have a startup and you're trying to sell something. It's really hard to predict why someone might buy a particular product or not, right? It's not always necessarily about the quality of the product. There's a lot about the conditions of the market that, are, that is really unpredictable. So, um, you know, the invitation to an interview or the sales of a product are not a direct reflection of the quality of in this case at least the individual and i think knowing that is very important uh for even things like mental health and just you know making sure that if i didn't get invited it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with me it just means that you know maybe they were looking for something else okay makes sense yep and what were the 
commonalities and differences between the institutions uh, that you like observe during interviewing? Uh, commonalities uh, in terms of what, in terms of the structure or in terms of uh, people, I guess there are yeah. a lot of different dimensions we can go into here. <laughs> right. Uh, I guess the question is purposefully uh, ambiguous, but uh, <laughs> sure, it could be, for example, like the kind of um, attitudes of the interviewees. Um, I assume at some places uh, they were, let's say, more collegial or at some sure. other places, perhaps more um, like uh, challenging you, for example. Yeah, so I guess one thing that is common, uh, you know, in all interviews, they will all, you know, all the universities will say something very similar that, you know, we are all, we're all collaborative. Uh, there is no university that was interviewing you who will say we are not collaborative or we do not collaborate. Uh, every university will. So when you're interviewing, universities are also simultaneously trying to sell themselves to you, regardless of whether or not you'll get an offer, because if you do get an offer, they're probably going to compete with other universities to hire you. So they're also trying to sort of sell, sell you know, themselves to you. So you will hear sort of this, you know, the same things from many universities about, um, you know, how collegial they are, like, you know, how collaborative that they are, uh, you know, how, what, you know, what support they give to sort of junior faculty members. So I think it's hard to judge some of these things just by talking to people in the interviews. I think it's important to talk to uh, students uh, at that university. It's important to talk to recent hires at that university. Uh, to sort of really understand or even just gather your own data. So for, for example, one way to do this is to look at recent publications uh, from the department and you know, at least in your area and to see how many of them have co-authors who are like multiple faculty members or you know, ask about the students and how, you know, who's advised by whom and how much they collaborate with other faculty members uh, who are not their advisors or look at things like grants awarded on you know, public uh, repositories. Like for example, uh, NSF grants in the United States are all public, so you can look at the, you know, you can look at the grant database and you can see, you know, are these, are faculty members from here actually collaborating on, let's say, grants. So you can get a lot of this data uh, objectively instead of just, uh, you know, uh, expecting to trust every everyone who says, because they're also sort of trying to convince you to join them uh, if you get an offer. So do you have any special memories um, about the interviewing process uh, that stuck with you, for example, any kind of uh, questions that surprised you or some other memorable experiences? Um, I mean, I, I was interviewing during the pandemic. So there was already a lot of things that were memorable given that, given how crazy the, the virtual interviewing situation was. Um, I think my, my favorite question from all of the, uh, interviews, um, was, you know, if, so the, the question was as follows. It said that, you know, if, if in your area you were, um, you know, you're doing research say in software engineering, like for me, it was software engineering and testing. So in your area, if, if uh, you know, you were to receive a Turing award for something or, okay, let me back that up. The question was, if someone were to receive a Turing award uh, in this area, what would it be for? What, are, what is the problem that if in this area that if solved, uh, you know, would be worthy of getting a Turing award? And that's a trick question because, you know, if you sort of answer only based on your own research problem, it is sort of, you know, very narrow because, you know, you don't want to only think about your own research problem. There are many problems that are important to media science or in this field. But if you talk about uh, other problems that are open and important, then it's also, well, why are you working on this other thing? And why not, not working on the most important thing? So it's a, it's a trick question, uh, which I found really, uh, you know, interesting to think about uh, and, and challenging to answer. Uh, not that it actually matters. I think people who ask these questions are just doing it uh, for fun. I don't think that you know the answer to this question is going to decide whether or not they uh, vote for uh, giving an offer. But I think it's a it's a fun and interesting question to think about. And after completing the interviews, did you follow up with the interviewers uh, in some way? Yeah, in most cases, I did send a thank you email to uh, at least my host and um, other uh, interviewers with whom I had a maybe a special conversation. Like maybe we spoke about something that. Um, you know, was either memorable or maybe we said that, you know, we'll follow up with something. So often in conversations, it's like, okay, maybe I'll share a link with you about some paper, about something else. Uh, or maybe there were collaboration opportunities that we could, uh, uh, you know, that we discussed. Uh, so in those cases, I would sp send uh, special emails. I think in my first few interviews, I tried to send emails to almost every person who I spoke to during the interview. But towards the end, that got uh, also a little tiring. So I think I slacked off on emailing every single person by the end of it. Yeah, so how did you proceed after receiving your first offer? Did you reach out to other institutions to, for example, ask for a quicker decision or ask for a deadline extension or anything like this? Right. So uh, the first offer that I received, I had a fairly long um, 
deadline to get back. So I did not really feel the need to reach out uh, to institution. But I think in the second or third offer, there was a deadline that I had to uh, decide uh, before. Uh, and at that time, I hadn't actually finished interviewing. So I emailed um, the the hosts of where I was going to interview to say, hey, I'm you know coming to interview at your place, but I you know she wanted to let you know that I also have an offer that's expiring in like you know two weeks. So um, you should sort of know that because I'm interviewing you know uh, at, your, at your place like next week. So if you know if you uh, want to give me an offer, it would have to be done in one week. Is that even possible? If not, you know maybe this is uh, you know not not going to work out. Um, again, it depends on where that offer was from. So if that offer came from a you know place that was very highly ranked on my list, it would mean something very different. If it was low on my list, it would mean something different. So in my case, I had a couple of different offers, uh, and I did reach out to uh, you know uh, also places where I had interviewed but not heard back to say, well, I have this offer. Um, you know, do you can you tell me the status of the deliberations? Do you have any idea uh, about where I can hear back? Uh, most people got back to me uh, with with some response. Now, my particular case was also a little weird because it was in the it was just was just when the pandemic uh, hit everywhere. This was in April 2020, so a lot of universities actually had a hiring freeze because they thought that you know there's going to be a recession and everyone's going to go bankrupt. So I actually heard back from a few places saying that yes, I think you know we've discussed your. Uh, your case and we want to give you an offer but we don't have the authority to do that <laughs> so that was also a little bit uh, you know worrisome that there are these different levels where the department votes on you know to give you an offer and then there's university level actual somebody has to trigger this approval to actually you know uh, make that offer with the salary and everything so uh, sometimes the process gets stuck in the way uh, or at least it did in my case so uh, that was a little bit annoying but after communicating with with hosts i think many of those some of those things at least got resolved and how did you convert towards a decision? So what were the relevant uh, factors there? Um, I think mm, some of the most important ones were, uh, you know, peop the people, I think the most important one is people, uh, people who I would, uh, you know, get to work with uh, and, you know, and the sort of community or the climate of the place itself. So at CMU, I felt that there are a lot of, uh, you know, researchers here in, in software engineering who I could work with. The people who I spoke to were, you know, amazing. Uh, the university seemed to care about similar issues that I did uh, in terms of everything from the like, diversity and inclusion, in terms of the importance of teaching and education is something that I really like. Not all universities, uh, you know, put a lot of emphasis on the quality of teaching uh, as much as research, um, as well as things like, uh, you know, just the location of the university uh, in terms of, you know, the, the geography of the place. I like, personally, for example, I personally wanted to be in a place which was more of a city than a small town. Um, also, like for example, CMU is in it's in Pittsburgh, which is uh, pretty nice. This is Pittsburgh right behind me. This downtown Pittsburgh uh, has a lot of uh, you know beautiful rivers, and it's quite green, so it's uh, it's a nice place to get around. The university is also in the middle of the city, so it's uh, it's really easy to get to. So I live within walking distance of uh, the university, as do many other faculty members. So I think that was also uh, really nice and uh, something that I uh, found appealing, uh, and and also opportunities for my uh, spouse to. Uh, uh, to work as you're sort of relocating together. Uh, and this was a place where she also had a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for, uh, uh, for, for in, 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 her, in her profession. She's not an academic. So she, you know, we were looking at uh, businesses in a different domain and, and Pittsburgh was a place where that uh, made sense. Could uh, CMU also help out with your two uh, party situation? Right, so in most universities, if, if both, if you're in sort of in a you know, two-party situation with uh, where both partners are, um, in academia, there's sort of a very different route, which I don't have any experience with, but I do know of a lot of people who have uh, been able to negotiate, um, you know, getting sort of simultaneous offers. So if one person gets an offer from one department or and the other person, like the other partner is, is uh, also trying for a faculty position or a system scientist position in the same or different department, the university often does work to be able to give both partners uh, uh, those kind of that kind of offer. Uh, in my case, that was not necess necessarily true because my spouse is not in sort of computer science or not in um, academia. So we were looking at jobs outside of the university. So there the universities do help a little bit with things like, uh, you know, uh, networking and, and giving contacts. Uh, but it's a much harder thing because they don't have as much control in actually being able to, you know, find you a, a specific job opening. Okay, makes sense. Yep. And did you negotiate any of the parameters of the offer? Uh, Yes, I think uh, I, you know it's important to negotiate uh, you know any offer that you get. Um, so I did negotiate with all the universities that I was seriously considering. 
Um, but I think that in, you know, the, there is sort of a way to do this negotiation. So I'm, I'm not sure whether they did it right or not. And I don't even know if the res end result of my negotiations was, uh, you know, I guess the most that I could get or with, you know, how it compares to, uh, you know, other candidates. Um, but I think the main thing is to be able to justify uh, what it is that you're looking for. So uh, when I was talking to, you know, the department here, here as well as in other universities, for any sort of negotiation, um, whether it was on salary, on startup, or in any other things that they offered, um, I made the point to actually give sort of a reason for why I was looking for, a, let's say, a different uh, configuration or a different number that they were offering. Um, so I think with justification, things, you know, the conversations become um, much e much easier, much more comfortable because it's, it's it's a little weird to come, you know, come back and say, hey, can you give me more money? So uh, it's it's uh, at least I found it useful to be able to draw up a plan, for example, uh, for startup you know, what my research group would look like, how many students I want to hire, what kind of resources I would need, what I would need to buy, and sort of provide that plan to the department head and say, okay, I would think I would need to spend X amount of money um, uh, in order to be successful. And I mean, the department wants you to be successful uh, as a junior faculty member. So if you can sort of give them that um, justification for what you could do if they give you more money and why that would make more sense to the department uh, for your own success, uh, you know, they would be more, I, I found that they're more sort of uh, uh, open to negotiating in that sense. Okay. Yep. Um, with that, I would say that uh, we can slowly wrap up. And okay. um, one question is like, uh, what, what kind of takeaways do you have from the job season and what kind of advice do you have for uh, future faculty candidates? Um, well, I, I might also respond in sort of a, you know with, with some meta information that there's a lot of survivor bias here when uh, talking to people who have successfully completed this process. So, uh, you know, before I give any advice, I would say that, you know, my advice would be disregard most of the advice that you would hear uh, because, uh, you know, things that I did or anybody else who was, uh, was happy with their job, there's, there's no, you know, anything that anyone says, there's no actual evidence to say that, you know, that, uh, those particular, um, I guess, tips or tricks or any other sort of methodology actually works better objectively than any other methodology, right? So there's a survivor bias that most of the advice that you would get and most of the examples that you would see of, are of people who have, who, you know, been successful or who are happy with uh, with the outcome. And you don't see a lot of these, you know, examples of negative outcomes. So it's, it's, a, it's hard to just learn from positive examples. So I would say the first thing is, you know, avoid... Uh, <laughs> you know taking too much advice from people and just do your own thing uh and and sort of tell your own story uh especially with things like writing research statements and giving job talks you get a lot of feedback and it's really important to get feedback and get perspectives but it's also i will say important to get feedback about perception and not about uh solutions so for example if i were to give a practice job talk I would want to know if someone didn't understand something that I said. Like I would ask them follow-up questions. Like, did you understand what you know what the impact of this was, or did you understand why this was you know the way it is? But I don't think good feedback is if someone comes back and says, you know what, I think you should have this diagram on slide eight, or you should change your statement to say this other sentence. Like, don't let somebody else you know uh, push their story onto you. So if you're getting feedback, just get feedback about the perception of the audience, and then make make your own decision on how to improve it rather than getting feedback on how to change what you should do. Because I think what you should do at the end should be an expression of yourself. And I think the other thing I would give as like actual advice, uh, you know, if, if uh, I had to give is that, uh, you know, you also want to find a place to work where you'll be happy. So I think, uh, you know, a lot, many people don't uh, give a lot of importance to things like, you know, location or, you know, I don't know, uh, people or the, you know, the, the city or the state that you're living in, the politics around you. Uh, you know, other such uh, issues, uh, but they're really important for things like mental health and well-being and just you know, having a career. At the end of the day, it's a job. So I will say, you know, pick a, you know, when making the decisions, keep all of those factors also in mind because they are very important because uh, it's, you know, much better to be in a place that you're happy in rather than a place that sounds good on paper, but where you're sort of miserable. So uh, I will say, yeah, uh, keep, keep an all-rounded picture in mind. Awesome advice. So thank you very much, Rohan, for great. sharing all of this. And uh, it was great talking to you. Yeah, thanks, Manuel. Yeah, this is great. Thanks a lot for having me uh, here and, uh, and for doing this interview.